Can you get me a Kleenex real quick? I usually have a Kleenex in my pocket, but uh, today's one of those days. Um, I'm going to start this out with a story real quick. Hi, girlies. <laughs> Someone has a <laughs> an issue <laughs> that they need to take care of. <laughs> I don't know about you guys. I know sometimes Jen kind of rolls her eyes, but um, I... I almost like the fact that they, those girls, oh, thanks. <laughs> they said that there must have been something in the cough drop last Sunday, so uh, Lauren's making sure I have one again this Sunday. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I like, I know sometimes, you know, people might say it's hard to kind of hear over some of the, the noise that kids make, but I love it. I personally love hearing the kids' noises in this church. I, I love it because that means that we have kids in this church and this church is going to continue to raise up, right? Oh, man, it's some of my favorite sounds. So do not feel bad, Jen, when those girls come running through here because that means that they're here. So anyway, uh, <laughs> maybe I should get this on. Uh, Get this in. They thought I swallowed it last Sunday. I was telling my mom as we were sitting there, I don't know, I was a weird child. You guys can't imagine that, right? Me being a weird child. <laughs> but I used to, whenever my dad worked at a factory, so we had meat and potatoes like every meal, right? And so we'd have like steak or whatever it was. And so a few hours after a meal, hi, girlies. Hello. Hello few hours after a meal, um, I would start chewing on something, and mom would go, what are you chewing on? I'd be like, well, I have a little bit of steak still in my mouth. So I don't know. I just got these pockets, I guess, that I can put those cough drops in, so I don't have to chew them up, and I don't have to swallow them right away. Um, anyway, back to my story. Sorry, I just rambled for a long time. No, Marcy, we can't imagine you being a weird child. <laughs> Sorry, back when Adam and I were going to the Nazarene Church in Bloomfield, um, it was right at about the time that we had started going there, because I remember it was, it was the kids, um, those that weren't in the nursery, Isaiah and David were in the nursery, so the girls and Adam and I, we were standing there, and, and it was one of our first times, because even, because we were, I remember us being on the left side towards the back, and that was really the only time we had ever sat there, back there, was when we first started going to that church. And so we were on the left side towards the back, and there was this gentleman in front of us, and he didn't necessarily always stand up during worship. He was unable to. He was really unsteady on his feet. And those moments that he did stand up, he usually had to hold on to a chair to, to stand up. And, and so I remember there was a moment where we were, he stood up during worship. And not only did he stand up, but he raised his hands in worship. And that was a big deal. Something touched him so much that he let go of all that was his security, that chair in front of him, and let go to raise his hands in praise to God. That was a moment for me. I started crying instantly in the pew because I just went, wow. And as I was thinking about this, this passage that we have this week, and that image continued to come back to my mind. And I feel like God put it there for, for this reason because that is the image of worship, right? Even in the darkest times, even in the, the, the lowest times that we can get to, we, we let go of that chair and we raise our hands. We let go of that security because God is our security, right? Because Jesus is our security and we need to worship him. And so today... As I said, as I was thinking through that passage, is we're going to get into that. We're still in P 
Peter, um, kind of looking at his life and what's going on. But we're to that. We're going to go to that passage where Jesus talks about the cost of being a disciple, and sometimes it does cost that, right? That security. So um, let's go ahead and get start, or let's go ahead and read this. Um, let me get to where I am in my notes. Matthew chapter 16. We're going to read from verse 21 to 28. Matthew chapter 16. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hand of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law and that he must be killed, and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. And Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are, are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory and with his angels, and he will reward each person according to what they have done. Truly, I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. There is a lot going on in this passage, and so we are going to look on a, we're going to look and zoom in on a few things that are going on in this passage, and man, I think that we could take a couple months to go through every point that is written in this little section of scripture. But as I said, we're going to kind of focus in on Peter and what's been going on with him. And so here, if we remember back, the passages right before this, Peter made this declaration, you are the Messiah, right? He said, you are the Messiah, which wasn't necessarily the Jewish thought pattern in that because the, they, the Jewish at that time thought the Messiah, and still today, they thought that that the Messiah had certain things that they had to do before they could ever be labeled the Messiah. And so Jesus said, just said, Peter, that was a divine revelation, right? That God had given that to you. And now, here in the next breath, Jesus says, I will have to die. I will have to suffer at the hands of those in charge, right? And I will die. I will come back to life. And Peter said, this can't be so, right? Because even though a moment ago he was in this, out of this Jewish thought of, you know, and he said, you are the Messiah. In this moment, Jesus, or Peter, is thinking more along the lines of there's got to be an easier way to do this, right? There's got to be an easier way. This can't happen. There's got to be an easier way. And so, Peter, who Jesus just said, Peter, you are a rock of faith, and I will build my church upon this rock, right? And now Jesus goes, you're a stumbling block to me. This rock is now turned into a stumbling block because Peter, Peter is more concerned about the human side of things than he is about the God side of things, right? And so we just had this moment where Peter, like, Peter got the gold star, right? <laughs> now Peter's back into going, there's got to be a different way. There's got to be a different way. And so Jesus basically tells them, it tells Peter, tells them, you got to zoom out, right? You got to zoom out and look at the bigger picture here. We can't just zoom in and see, this is what you're looking at. You're looking at this small section. But you've got to zoom out and you've got to see God knows it all, right? God knows it all. And sometimes what we look at is just that small little picture, right? But we've got to zoom out. And then Jesus explains that if 
the disciples truly want to follow him, they will have to lose their lives. If they truly want to live, they have to give up their lives. Whew. That's a hard thing to read. Because in that, in that, we know when Jesus says that, if you want to follow me, you have to give up your life, we know that there's no half in, half out, right? It's all in or all out. There's no halfway point. We can't just, uh, uh, well, I'll give you this, this much. There's none of that, right? And Jesus is saying, in that, in that, he says, you are going to give me my life, your life, your life will be, will be gone, given up, if you want, truly want to follow me. But that is also meaning you're going to put your thoughts more in God's thoughts, in God's hands, than in human concerns, right? Because we just had that with Peter. You're thinking small picture. You need to think larger picture in this. So as we think about this, and as I said, there's a lot going on in this passage. We're going to focus in on one little thing. I want us to focus in on that passage. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it but whoever loses their life for me will find it. In thinking about that, thinking about that and Peter, you know, this whole story, can we say with certainty that we have given our lives completely over to Christ? Absolutely. I, you know, I'm a pastor. I can't say... I can't say, we're not talking about coming to church. We're not talking about tithes and offerings. We're not talking about your talents. We are. It's all of that, but it's more than that, Amen. right? That, that stuff's great, but that's not all. It's talking about giving your life completely over. Your ambitions for life, the plans that you had for life. If God asked you to change them, would you change them? That's what we're talking about. You had a plan for life. You go off to college. You go, I'm going to be a teacher. And God says, well, I want to take you and make you a teacher in Africa. Right? Are we going to go, okay, Lord, that's where you want to send me? I'll go. Maybe I made plans for my life. Maybe I thought I was going to have this comfortable life, but maybe it's not going to be. Are we willing to give that up? Our ambitions. If you lose your life, you'll find it. If you want to save your life, then you'll lose it. And I want to say, this is not a small commitment, right? Right? This is not a small commitment. This is not a decision we make in just a moment and we go, oh yeah, I'm a follower of Christ now. This is something we have to think about because we, we, give, we are giving our lives over. This is not a small thing. The cost is high. And as we talked about last week, not everyone's going to be willing to pay that price. Not everyone's going to be willing to give up their own ambitions. When uh, this is obviously in the gospel message, and so Luke puts that verse this way, or the verse in there this way. Then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily. And follow me. Luke puts that in there. Pa take up their cross daily. Matthew just says they got to take up their cross and follow me, right? But Luke points it out. Take up their cross daily. It means sometimes we've got to deny ourselves daily. Bring ourselves back into alignment with where, where it is that God wants us to do. 
And you know, I think sometimes we even have to go farther than that, right? Sometimes we got to do it hourly, <laughs> right? <laughs> sometimes we've got to sit down and go, I was off. I need you to bring me back where I need to be hourly. Sometimes we may be even facing temptation, and it's got to be minute by minute, right? Where we've got to go, Lord, please just help me through this. Help me direct my path where it is that you want me to go this minute and the next minute and the minute after that. But we've got to do that, right? We've got to pick up our cross daily and follow him. This is nothing that's going to be simple. This is not just about coming to church and paying your tithe and you know singing in the choir, which are all great things. Absolutely. But that's not what this is just about. This is about giving our lives over completely, fully, every decision, everything that we do. We gather here on a Sunday every week. And in that time, it's a time for us to redirect our thoughts, right, for the week. It's kind of this time to come together, to be together with, with our church family and to listen to what it is that God has to say to us. And it's this time of redirection every week. Oh, yeah. So I maybe fell off the wagon at the end of the last week. I need to go to church. I need to get my ducks in a row right again. Sometimes we do that. There's another reason, that's another reason why we've been partaking in, in communion every Sunday for, for since the beginning of the year. It's because we need that reminder. We've entered into that covenant with Jesus. We have given up our lives. And sometimes it's a daily thing. Sometimes it's a weekly thing. We need that reminder that we have given our lives, which means every part of us. Every decision that we make, everything that happens to us, we give it to God, right? Because it's not about us anymore. It's not about our ambitions. It's not about what we want. It's about God. Now, as much as we think we kind of go, yeah, the cost is high, Cost is absolutely high. But this isn't necessarily a bad thing, right? This isn't necessarily a bad thing. This isn't a negative. Because Jesus says that if we lose our life, then he will give it back to us, right? This, we come out of the grave. We left the grave behind into new life with Jesus, right? But sometimes we try to keep holding on to that grave, don't we? That's what it really is, truly. We try to keep holding on to that. Well, it's nice and dark in here, or it's nice and cool in here, right? I don't really keep holding on to that. We come together as a church to remind ourselves every Sunday that we are in this covenant with Jesus, and we have given our lives fully over to him, every part of our life. Every inch, every decision, everything, right? Over to God. We come in, we're reminded, and then our, what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to go back out into the world and pour into others, right? And pour into others the way that God has poured into us and given us that new life. And we're supposed to show the love to others that God has shown to us. If we need to, um, sorry, I'm trying to find it where I'm on my notes. Getting our lives over means living in the kingdom, right? Even though we're living here, we're living our lives as if we were in the kingdom because we are, right? Stepped out of that grave. We're in living our new life with Jesus now. This is sometimes, sometimes 
we think of our lives as merely just this little this little snapshot, right? Well, it really doesn't matter if I don't do that. It really doesn't matter if I don't do that cuz I'm just I'm just one person. What is it what does it matter? I'm just one person. But no, we got to think that big picture, right? We may be one person, but we're one person. And God can use us if we allow him to. If we allow him to, right? We're called to take kingdom thinking and God into every situation we're in because, as Paul puts it, it's no longer us who are living, but Christ who's living in us, right? So that's what we agree to. We say, in that moment, we say, Lord, I give up my life to follow you. I know you will give me new life, and I'll use that new life and spread your love throughout this world, right? Your creation. We are called to spread that love, but we are called to have this new life in Christ, and that means that we are called to have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, right? And that means every situation that we go into, we are called to bring that into every situation, right? That's what we're called to do. If, that, if we don't, if we bring the opposite into every situation, then you know what that means? That means there's something less left of us in there, right? There's something that we haven't given up to God. Some part of our lives that we haven't completely given over. But the great thing is, is we're never called to do this alone, right? We're never called this to do this alone. God is with us, and we've got this great community that, we ha that God has built around us, right? Our church community. And we can come together on Sundays and we can admit our struggles and our failures of this last week. And we can gain strength through other believers that are pouring into us as well, right? And that's the whole purpose of church. Jesus said, I will build this assembly and even the gates of Hades will not prevail, right? So we come together and we are able to admit our, our failures. We're able to admit our fears together. And we have other people lifting us up in prayer, continuing to speak to God to, about us. And that's what this assembly is about. So we've all given our lives. We've all said, Lord, take and use me however it is that you want to. We as a church are called to take the kingdom into every situation that we enter into, right? Not only individually, but we as a church, as an assembly, are called to bring the kingdom into every situation that we are enter into. We are called to be the hands and the feet of Jesus, however he wants to use us in that situation. See, in this passage of Scripture, we can see that it's not necessarily that the church just comes in and sits behind closed doors, right? It's not what Jesus was talking about when he was talking about this assembly. This is a church that comes in, that gathers, and to goes out, right? This is what we're called to do. As believers, we, we give our lives over to Christ. We come together as an assembly. And we go out and spread that kingdom 
that kingdom culture into the world, right? That love, that joy, that peace, that patience, that kindness, that goodness, that faithfulness, and that self-control. And that's what we're called to do. Being a part of this assembly, this ecclesia, that Jesus said, this ecclesia, this isn't just about coming to church and filling a seat and paying your tithe and maybe singing in a chorus whenever we get one of those, right? That's not just what this is all just about. Those are all great things. Absolutely. But that's not what this is all about. This is about living life together, right? It's about living life together and taking the kingdom out, the kingdom culture out. Being a part of this assembly means to love God so much that in every single situation we put him first, right? Being part of this assembly, being part of, of the church that, that Jesus talks about, meaning that we will love others so much we will put their needs first, right? Talking about that, that commandment, love God, love others, right? So when we say we were going to give up our lives, that is what we are saying. That we will love God so much we will put him first. And we will love others so much we will put their needs first. And that's what the cost is. That's a high price. I don't like to... Um, Maybe controversial, maybe I shouldn't say this, but <laughs> I don't necessarily like to uh, just go out and, and try to find people on the streets and try and to get them to just come to Jesus because I think it takes more than that, right? It takes a relationship. It takes knowing them. We're not just interested in just getting people across the starting line, right? We're interested in the whole race, right? This has got to be a whole, and they got to know what it is that they're entering into. And when we, sometimes I feel like sometimes we can cheapen the gospel by just saying, well, it's a one and done kind of thing. You just got to pray this prayer, and then you're done, and then you don't have to do anything. And that's not what it is, right? That's not at all what it is. Sometimes we make it that way. And I just, I know, I see people do it. And I just kind of go, do they really know what they're signing up for? Are we really explaining it to them? Because this is a high cost. This is a high cost. I don't know if you guys have realized that, but this is a high cost. To be a disciple of Jesus is a high cost because it costs our life. It costs all of us our dreams because we give that to Jesus and we go whatever it is that you want us to do we'll do so sometimes the things that w the ambitions that we had in our life we're not going to be doing because it's not about us right I refuse to cheapen the gospel to the point where people don't know what they're signing up for because they deserve to be given the proper amount of time to really make that decision. And because sometimes worshiping God means taking your desires in life and handing them over. Sometimes worshiping God means letting go of that chair, right? Standing with your arms raised, letting go of that security that you had, and just worshiping. And that's a high cost, right? Not everybody's going to do that. Coming, coming into this covenant is a lifelong commitment. It's like entering a marriage or having a child. And a lot of times it looks like giving up your own wants to fill the needs of others around you, right? And that's what worship looks like. 
So here in a moment, Bella, you help with the communion cups. We're going to take communion. If you've come into this covenant, if you have given your life over to Christ, you are free to partake. You don't have to be a member of this church. You don't have to want to be a member of this church to participate in this. Is if you've given your life over. If you have acknowledged that Jesus is your Savior. And if you feel like you need to pray before you take communion, if you feel like there's a, something that God's really laying on your heart and you just need to pray that out, then Lord, the, I pray that you do that. I pray that God leads you in that way. Because in these moments, in these moments where we're sitting together in this assembly, if God is speaking to us, then we need to be listening, right? If God is speaking to us in these moments, then we need to be listening. The cost of discipleship is high. And we've got to be in that agreement. And we've got to remind ourselves that we have agreed to that. I'm going to give us a moment for all those that feel that the Lord has led that they need to pray before they partake in communion. Let us pray together. Holy God, we gather at this, your table, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who by your Spirit was anointed to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, to set at liberty all those who were oppressed. We know, Lord, that Christ healed the sick and fed the hungry and ate with sinners and established this new covenant for forgiveness of sins. And we live in the hope of his coming again. We eat these elements as a reminder of what was, what you are currently doing in our lives, and what is to come. And we pray, Lord, that you continue to remind us that these sacraments are a sign of a covenant that we have with you. Lord, we pray that you continue to guide us at this time. Amen. It was on the night in which Jesus was betrayed that he took the bread and gave thanks and broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This is the body of our Lord Jesus Christ broken for you. Eat this in remembrance. Likewise, when the supper was over, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. This is the blood shed for you. Drink this in remembrance. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we gather as the body of Christ to offer ourselves to you in praise and in thanksgiving. And we pray, Lord, that you pour out your Holy Spirit on us and on these, your gifts. We pray, Lord, that you make them by the power of your Spirit to be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by only his blood. 
by your spirit, Lord. We pray that you make us one in Christ and one with each other and one in the ministry of Christ to all the world until Christ comes in that final victory. We pray, Lord, that you just continue to guide our hearts and what it is that you want us to do, Lord. Continue to guide our paths. Lord, we just thank you that in giving our lives that we find a new life in you. And we no longer have to be chained to the old things that we were chained to before. We no longer have to stay in that grave that you have raised us to new life. And Lord, I pray that we just continue to live that life in the ways that you ask us to. Lord, we just love you and we give you all the praise. We ask these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We're going to sing a song today, um, just a cappella. We're going to sing Spirit of the Living God because I just, that line, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the Living God, fall fresh on me. I wanted us to sing that. So let's sing that together. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Melt me. We just pray that you continue to be with us this, today and continue to be with us as we leave here. And Lord, I pray that you just continue to guide us in the steps that we're taking, Lord. And Lord, I pray that if there is a part of our lives that we haven't completely given over to you, that you direct us, Lord, that you show us, hey, you're still holding on to this, Lord. You're still holding on to this. And Lord, I pray that you continue to just show this, that to us, that we may give all of our lives over to you. Lord, I pray that you just continue to guide us in how you want us to live our lives. Lord, this new life that you have, been, that you have given to us, that is yours to do with whatever it is that you want to do. And Lord, I pray that we just continue to give you permission to live through us. Lord, I pray that you continue to show us if there's a part of our lives that we're not showing love or peace or joy or any of those things. Lord, I pray that you point that out. And Lord, I pray that you just continue to show us how to be those things in every situation, how to be Christ in every situation. Lord, we just love you. And we thank you that you give us direction in that way. Lord, we love you and we give you all the praise. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You guys.